finished with elk. All right, this is the last lecture I own. We're going to talk about uh, uh, FM, the threshold in the effect in, in, in FM. And then uh, the second lecture, we're going to be just uh, working some problems that uh, illustrate the material that we have covered uh, you know, since the midterm up to this point. Okay, so let's talk about uh, threshold in effect in FM. Uh, okay. <coughs> Here's what we did last time. We looked at the FM reception. So this is FM receiver. And if you remember, you know, our methodology is to define two signal-to-noise ratios, one at the input, one at the output. So this is the signal-to-noise at the input, and this is the signal-to-noise at the output. And after some uh, math, last time we, did, we found out that the signal-to-noise and the output is going to be some processing gain times signal to noise and input, which uh, is kind of general formula that is valid for every single modulation scheme. Now, in uh, case of FM, we found that the processing gain depends on several factors, and uh, we derived an expression that it is three times one plus beta, beta squared, two times to the power of the message normalized. So that was a processing gain in uh, FM. And for commonly used values for these parameters, beta, let's say, of 4 or 5, this is a very large number, right? So that's, uh, that uh, gave us a justification for using FM, because you have seen all the all steps along the way, FM was not that easy. It, it's not easy to modulate, it's not easy to demodulate, it is having a bandwidth that's bigger than two times the bandwidth of the of the message signal in the basement, so it's less efficient when band, when bandwidth is taken into account than double side and AM. But it has a very large processing gain, and that helps you tremendously when you're fighting the noise. One uh, <coughs> commonly in uh, it is uh, we express signal-to-noise ratio in dB. So if you take this relationship here, then it is uh, whatever is the processing gain expressing dB and plus signal-to-noise ratio of the input expressing dB. And we've seen that it's not uncommon to have 20 to 30 dB of the processing gain in FM. Now, that's Beautiful, but what happens is, let's just let's just plot this, right? So let me plot this, and then we'll discuss one of the things that we did <coughs> that now comes back into light that uh, we kind of pushed aside during the derivation. So this is uh, the relationship between signal-to-noise ratio and the input expressed in dB. And this is a signal to noise ratio and the output expressing dB. This is this would have been curve uh, should be straight line. Then. This is a straight line of uh, processing gain equals zero dB. And then for every uh, if you look at uh, this line, uh, this is a line in the dB dB domain. Then what happens for different processing gains? You have lines that are kind of stacking up like this. Right? This the distance of this line is your processing gain, right? and this would be for beta one, beta two, beta three, where beta three is greater than beta 2 is greater than beta 1. What this uh, graph says, if you have, for example, a given signal-to-noise ratio and you're using beta 1, this is the signal-to-noise ratio of the output, the distance of this graph from the, the straight line that goes through the origin and with the unity slope 
is your processing gate. So that's beautiful. So if you look at this, what would be your inclination? Why don't I use beta as large as, as I can, right? There is definitely incentive here to make beta as large as possible, right? But there's a catch. If you remember, one of the, actually there are two things that you need to remember. First thing is what is the bandwidth in FN modulated signal? Two, two times one plus beta times W. So it depends on beta, right? In a linear fashion, if beta grows, the bandwidth requirements grow as well. The second one is the key here. In us, there in our derivation of this, one of the major assumptions that we uh, that we introduced was that the signal to noise and the input is large, right? Because we neglected a whole bunch of things. Remember when we derived the power spectral density of the thermal noise, one implicit assumption there was that uh, your noise is much smaller than the signal. That was one of the things that allow us to get rid of a whole bunch of terms. Now, let's say your signal power is constant and you start increasing beta. What happens to your signal to noise ratio input? Again. Bandwidth increases, the noise increases, signal stays the same, right? Because if the signal power is whatever the signal power is. So as you start increasing beta, what happens, this assumption becomes weaker and weaker. Right, and it uh, and it, at some point you cannot make that assumption anymore. Your noise might become as strong as your signal. So now let's travel down from here on one of these curves. You're gonna for large signal to noise ratios, you're gonna be on this ideal curve. But then as you decrease, your at some point your Input signal to noise ratio is not going to be good enough to justify the assumption that your signal to noise ratio is large. And at that point, <coughs> the performance of your FM degrades rapidly. Right? Now, if you travel the same way on these different curves, here's what happens. So for a larger beta, because the bandwidth is larger, you require signal to noise ratio input to be larger as well. And then if it's large enough, then when the processing gate kicks in and you get tremendous improvement there, right? So this effect is called thresholding or FM capture effect. And uh, the question is, what is the location of this point at which this happens? What is the minimum signal to noise ratio that I need to have in the FM signal at the input before I can claim that there is a significant processing gate? The relation of that is not very easy, but there is an approximate <coughs> formula that's given in your book that is called, that gives a threshold. So this here is going to be S of N threshold. And the approximate formula is this. For signal to noise ratio threshold is given as S of N threshold is equal to 13 plus 10 log 1 plus B. So the location, this is expressed in DB. Okay. So the location of this point is given uh, with this formula. And you, and you can see now as beta becomes larger, this point pushes to the right. So it's kind of like all good news until now. Now we're saying, okay, well, it's you're getting large improvement if you already have a good signal to noise ratio. Right? So it's it's uh, which beta you're gonna use for a given system now all of a sudden becomes a trade-off between several different things. You have trade-off versus bandwidth where as you use larger beta, you have, uh, you have a larger bandwidth, so you're paying for the processing gain with bandwidth. Then uh, the decision on beta is also, what processing gain do I need? 
and then what process once you know the process in game then can I derive deliver this threshold to the input of my C. So all of these come into play and when you solve these problems and when you work with FX, you gotta be careful that you consider all of these things before you before you uh, come up with a solution. So let me uh, give a couple of examples here, or actually a single example. So consider an FM system, beta is equal to five, calculate the input signal to noise ratio threshold. So what is the SN threshold in the input? And how large is the processing gain? Assume that uh, we're modulating with a pure sinusoidal, so the power of the message normal is equal to 0 0.5. This is uh, assuming that here, because uh, you remember in the, in the, this P, I, I had it, capital M, lowercase n, is the power of the message signal. So it is, if it's a sinusoidal, we know that the power of the sinusoidal is one half. So signal to noise threshold here is going to be 13 plus 10 log 1 plus 5, which gives you 20.78 dB. And then if your signal is already above 21 uh, dB, then you get the processing gain, which is going to be 10 log of 3, uh, 1 plus 5 times 5 squared times 2 times 0 0.5. And this gives you a processing gain of 26.5. So you are, if you are above 21 dB, you are actually above uh, 47 dB. Right, because the receiver is going to bring additional uh, 26 dB to your to your uh, signal to noise. But if you are below 20 dB, the signal de deteriorates really rapidly, and this processing gain becomes smaller. And then, very, you know, within a within a few dB of this, your signal becomes completely uh, completely deteriorated. And this is remember last time I talked about a little bit. I said FM is famous for its very fast degradation. You listen to FM radio station on, in your car, and then within a hundred meters, it deteriorates to the point where you have to switch switch the channel. And that's this threshold in effect, right? Because if it's good, it's really good. Once it starts being bad, it deteriorates really, really fast. Okay? So in, in the chart over there, that's me. <coughs> the SN uh, T is going to be 20. 0.28 dB and what? processing gain for uh, for the beta of 5 that's me yeah <coughs> no, it's getting in the up. this is what <coughs> let me let me draw just this one curve because this is signal to noise ratio input and this is signal to noise ratio up this is the input equal up so this is ideal curve the difference here is 26.5 26. dB. That's your processing gain. This is for beta and yeah. for phi, right? So it's it's beautiful, right? You get these performance improvements that uh, that are very very large. 20, 20. This is close to 27. 27 dB is what 500 times. So you're improving your uh, your signal to noise ratio 500 times. But the picture is not as good as this, as this claims. What actually happens is this, right? And this knee here occurs at 21 dB, right? So if you're above 21 dB, you're actually at the input, then you're above 47 dB at the output, 48 dB at the output. But if you're below 21, then you actually fall so fast, your, your signal to noise ratio degrades rapidly. Right? So that's the thresholding effect. This is, this is the performance. I didn't elaborate on that, but uh, double sideband large carrier with coherent modulation has the same kind of behavior. It's not as, as drastic though. 
Remember one of the assumptions that we, when we derive the performance for double side band large carrier with coherent modulation, we said, let us assume that the input signal to noise ratio is large. And then we show that when that's the case, the coherent and, and envelope detector have the same performance. But if you start degrading input signal to noise ratio, that assumption is not true. And your ideal demodulator, which is a coherent demodulator, stays on a line where the line has a 3 dB and also because it's a two, two times better. Your signal to noise ratio the output is two times better than signal to noise ratio the input for double side and large K. No, sorry, not for large K. Uh, the, 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 it has a certain slope, but then if you put your envelope detector, it will follow that slope for uh, for large signal to noise inputs, and then it will kind of depart and fall off the cliff for low ones, for which the assumption that input signal to noise ratio is large is not valid anymore. Okay? And this is known effect. This is called F. Uh, this is called FM capture or FM thresholding. You know, you always you always uh, uh, hear them. There are methods that are used to extend all of this a little bit, but even if you extend it, the same. If you just move this this knee a little bit to the left, but um, but it's still there. It's still there. Okay, so that addresses. Uh, FM threshold. We have noticed one thing last time, and I promise that we're going to elaborate more on it. And uh, that's the fact that the output noise in uh, FM system does not have uniform or does not have flat spectral characteristics. Let me refresh your memory there. So, improvement of FM performance due to spectral shape. what we derived the last time. Spectral, power spectral density of the noise at the base band of uh, FM receiver is given with uh, this expression. S and output um, and output of F was one half k squared f squared over s times n zero. Let me uh, specify what these quantities are. n zero is the power spectral density one side of the noise and the input. If we're dealing with the thermal noise, and zero is going to be that kT, right? Or possibly kT times f, if you if you take into account the noise figure of your receiver, right? So that's the power spectral density of the noise uh, at the input of the receiver. We assume for all of our derivations here that the noise has a flat power spectral density, that it is white noise, not essentially a thermal noise. This uh, S here is AC squared over 2, which is power of the signal. Right? And uh, this K is the slope of the discriminator characteristics. Discriminator. Uh, frequency response.
just to refresh your memory, if you think, uh, if you go back and look at how do we demodulate, um, how do we demodulate um, FM signal? We saw that we have a filter that has uh, that we're using the skirt of that filter that has the characteristics here where your magnitude of H of F is going to is was some K of uh, uh, let's say some V zero plus K uh, F minus F C right so that's the frequency dependence over this this range here that we care about the bandwidth of the of the signal. And what we're doing here, we're having a filter that translates the frequency variations here into amplitude variations, and then we demodulate that uh, using envelope detector. So the slope of this filter is k. And that k is what appears in this, uh, in this expression here. So that's the power spectral density of the noise and now at the output. So if you were to plot this, this is the plot. This is frequency axis. Your signal exists from minus W to plus W. Your input power spectral density looks somewhat like this. So this is your S and input of F. And this is equal to N0 over 2. So that's a uh, uh, power spectral density of the noise of the input. But the output now looks like this. All right, so this is S and output of F. It is proportional to F squared, okay? So that's the power spectral density of your, of your noise at the output. What do you notice here? Uh, it is not affecting, this power spectral density is not affecting uh, the components of the signal in the same way. Let's put, uh, let's say, your signal, let's assume that it looks like this. So this is your, uh, it needs to be symmetric, right? So make it a little bit. So let's say this is a power spectral density of your signal. And this is how typically they look like. Now, what do you notice? The components that are at the low end of this, or at the low frequency end of the, of, in the power of your signal, are not corrupted with much noise. Why? Because the FN modulator, demodulator gets rid of this low frequency noise. But the components that are at the high end of the spectrum are ex having more and more noise, right? So the, the power spectral density uh, is such that it is affecting all of my high frequency components in the signal the most, right? The higher frequency component in the signal, the highest, uh, the lowest signal to noise ratio, if you just leave the, leave the FM demodulator without any spectral shape. Now this is, a bad, uh, th this is kind of, uh, uh, for most signals, relatively bad form of the power spectral density of the noise. Why is that the case? If you look at the, most of the signals that, we, that are of interest to us, like voice or video or image or whatever may be the case, the uh, components that are of the high frequency carry quite a bit of information. Let me give you the, uh, illustrate that with the example of voice. When I talk to you, uh, what happens is there's a stream of air coming uh, through my lungs, and what my mouth and, and tongue and, and all that stuff uh, uh, does is it modulates, right? So I think of it uh, as, a, as a essentially a signal unmodulated that I blow from, from my lungs, and then I modulate it through my, uh, through my uh, uh, audio apparatus here that I have. Now, there are parts of that signal that carry a lot of power. When I say A and E and O, those carry a lot of power because they're almost uninterrupted stream of what comes from my lung. 
but there are components that carry very little power. Like when I say B, P, S, T, all of these consonants, they carry very little power, right? Unfortunately, that's what makes uh, what I'm saying legible, right? And that's where that's what carries the information, right? So all of these consonants have the spectral content that is in the high end of my of my signal. And unfortunately, that's where the FM modulation attacks the most. That's where there is the most noise. So from the standpoint of, so that's where the signal to noise ratio is not a, uh, an accurate representation of the quality of the signal. It, uh, it matters what the signal to noise ratio is, but not all signal to noise ratios uh, uh, are the same. If the noise is spectrally shaped so that it attacks the most vulnerable part of the signal, then the signal to noise ratio even may be high, but the legibility of what is being sent goes down. And we all know that. I mean, uh, you've all experienced and, and this is the common practice even today. When you talk to somebody on the phone and you are trying to spell something to them, you would say O, A, you know, I. And they would understand that quite well because there's a high signal to noise ratio there because the signal is having a high uh, high power but when you start want to say b p s t you would always say be like a boy yeah. be like a peter and the reason is because the, there's a very little power in these consonants and uh, and their power is concentrated in the high end of the spectrum and even though the persons hear you uh, hear you talking because of how the noise uh, introduces the impairment, they lose ability to uh, decipher what it is, right? The, the signal loses its legibility, right? So how do we tackle that? Well, there is something called spectral shape, or in case of FM, uh, use of what is called pre-emphasis and de-emphasis circuit that I'm gonna cover here, that will actually help us help us uh, uh, compensate for this. And the compensation will result in, a, in an improvement of the signal to noise ratio. But that's not the major thing that we're after here. What the major thing that we're after here is to change the spectral shape of the power spectral density of the noise at the output. We would like it to be, uh, we don't want it to go, go like this, we want to curve it down, right, to somehow avoid uh, this noise attacking the most vulnerable part of my signal. So let's uh, first, uh, you have now enough information, let me discuss the idea. It's, it is very important for you to grasp the idea, and then later we'll just, if you grasp the idea, then the math is straightforward, right? But uh, if you just look at the math without the idea, you would wonder what is going on here, why are you doing all this? So let me first draw how this works, and then we go block by block and try to just explain what the idea here is, and then after that we'll derive all the math and, and quantify the improvement. So uh, FM, let me put here FM using PEDE -E process. This PE stands for pre-emphasis and D is D -emphasis. okay so here's what um, we're gonna do we're gonna insert two blocks one is gonna be P let me actually draw the whole thing and then we'll discuss and then this block P is going to process my signal. Then I'm going to feed that into FM modulator. The signal is going to travel across the channel, be corrupted by noise. Then I'm going to run everything through a demodulator. And uh, everything is going to pass through the de-emphasis circuit. So here's where I have my message signal. Let's say this is a voice signal, M of T. 
I'm going to process this signal with a filter that uh, looks somewhat like this. Okay, okay. Or actually, let me, before I do that, uh, let me draw M of F, where this is done. So my signal is band limit, right? The free emphasis would have a spectral color, uh, the frequency response that looks somewhat like this. What is it doing, right? It is distorting my signal deliberately, but in a controlled way. What is it doing? It is taking these components here that are low in power, and it's amplifying, right? So it's taking the high frequency portion of the spectrum of my signal and, and amplifying that portion, leaving the low frequency portion unamplified. So if you were to plot this M after going through the pre emphasis so this is M, P, E of T, you get this, the same essential signal. But since, since the uh, high frequency components are amplified, you're gonna, it's going to look like this, right? All the high frequency variations are going to be enhanced in your signal, right? Because that's what my filter does. If you try to listen to this, it's very annoying, right? Because it takes all the high frequency part of my speech and it makes them really, really pronounced, right? And that we kind of, really, it's, it's very annoying to our ears, right? It's hurting the, that part of our ear. But nevertheless, that's the signal that is passed to the FN module. Now, between here and here, you know, the task of these, uh, of these two blocks are to recover the signal as it has been sent, right? So, if you now um, look at what happens here. After a demodulator, you get your signal back. Let me just put a block diagram here. This is my N pre-emphasized of F. So now my signal looks like this, right? Why? Because it, this whole portion here is amplified, right? Portion of my signal. Now, when, it, when I receive at this point, the signal is hopefully the same as, uh, so this is M pre-emphasized of F. And then you have your noise that looks like this. Right, so this is a signal, this is noise. Right, the noise is like this, the noise is proportional to F squared. Why? Because this noise here comes as a, as a white noise with a uniform power spectral density. It goes through a demodulator, which is an FM receiver, and we've learned that the, the output of the FM receiver, the power spectral density of the noise is proportional to F squared. So that's what's happening at uh, this point. What I should do is really just number these. One, two, three, four. And this is uh, one. This is two, both of these. This is now in point three. What happens in the point four? Well, the emphasis De-emphasis a filter that will de-emphasize uh, the high frequency components. So this is H of F de-emphasis. Let me extend this a little bit. Like, uh, like this, right? It will let again the lower portion of the signal go unchanged, but it will be complementary to whatever I uh, I did here, right? Here I'm amplifying linearly, and here I'm uh, attenuating as a, as a function of frequency, right? So it will, it will uh, de-emphasize the high frequency component. When you run this <coughs> signal through de-emphasis, what happens is this. The signal, this high end part of the signal is de-emphasized, so the signal goes back to its original shape, 
So for the signal, the combination of the pre-emphasis and de-emphasis is essentially canceling each other. But for the noise, the noise only sees de-emphasis, right? So for the noise, you end up with something that flattens the noise. Okay? So this is now, again, M of F. And this is now noise that uh, we emphasize. Okay? Any questions here? Go ahead. Yeah, everything's, uh, I guess I'm understanding, everything is a um, pre-emphasis, but when you're at three, it goes through a de-emphasis modulation, so it looks like it's succeeding, like it should be M of DEM or something like that, right? Here? Yes. Uh, this is just the same as this signal here, right? And pre-emphasis, right? This signal, a pre-emphasized message signal, right? So if this works as it's designed, right, FM, you have FM modulator, demodulator, they're complementary, so they cancel each other. So ideally, this signal is going to appear here as well. Right, so if this signal here is the M pre-emphasized of F, the same signal appears in the point three, right, because whatever I did on the modulation side, that's what I did on the demodulation side. So the same, the, the, this system just, as far as the signal is concerned, just t took the signal from this point and regenerated it here, right? So that's for the signal. But for the noise, the noise just goes through demodulator, right? Because the noise goes through demodulator, you get the power spectral density of the noise that is proportional to F squared, right? So you get now a signal that is still attacked on a high end of the spectrum, but what happened through this in the, in deliberate distortion here, we emphasize the high end of the spectrum, making it more robust. So now, you cannot really present this to the user, because remember, this signal, pre-emphasized signal is very distorted, because it's not what you're expecting to see. It has the high frequencies emphasized. So now, when I run this through de-emphasis, it brings my signal back. It de-emphasizes the high frequencies, so as far as the signal is concerned, it sees pre-emphasis canceling de-emphasis. It says it sees FM modulator canceled by uh, demodulator. So from N to N, what I should have here is M of T reconstructed. So as far as the signal is concerned, everything is as it used to be. But as far as the noise is concerned, noise has demodulator, which makes it uh, is power spectral density proportional to F squared, but then it, just, it sees the de-emphasis, which is a frequency a selective filter that de-emphasizes high frequency components. So now the noise temp tempers down, right? Because you put this thing here and you de-emphasize it, and you brought it up. And you see here you have improvement in your signal to noise ratio. Why? Because the area of the curve under this noise is much smaller than the area under the curve under this noise. So you got rid of some of the noise. Right? You, you have to have pre-emphasis. Why did you have to have pre-emphasis? Because if you didn't have it, the, the signal would be, uh, the portion of the signal would be uh, filtered out as well by this filter. It is because you pre-emphasize, then when you filter with this filter, you go back to the original waveform. So, that, that's that's uh, these two are designed to work in a, in a conference. And there are two uh, benefits here. One is obvious, that's the improvement of the signal to noise ratio. But the second one is even more important. The second one is really why we do this. Because we are now improving the signal to noise ratio in the high frequency portion of my signal, the legibility of the signal, the information in the signal is being protected more. So now when you when you listen to this voice, it's clear not only that there is a signal to noise, so you can hear it, but you can also understand it better. Right? Why? Because you know those components that carry the information are now back and they're crisp and clean, you know, not just corrupted with the noise. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the pre uh, emphasize it's, uh, it's uh, amplified the signal. The it's step number two. Okay. It's spectrally shaped. It's shaped oh, really shaped. 
the shape of the signal. It's not, I'm going to go through some examples of the circuits here, and then we're going to go through example of what the pre emphasis and de emphasis look like in FM broadcasting. But remember the idea. The idea is you look and you say, okay, how does FM treat my signal? When everything is said and done, end to end, the, the biggest, the largest attack is on a high frequency end of my signal. So how do I protect it? And then you say, well, let me emphasize that part of the signal before I give it to the FM. So you take the high frequency portion of your spectrum of your signal and you amplify that, right? And then it goes through the signal and the idea is, you know, now that the noise is like this, make my signal like this so that the signal to noise ratio is the same across the board, right? Okay. And, then, and then you de-emphasize, you bring both of them back. Uh, both so the them. signal is back to what it was before it was pre-emphasized, but the noise is permanently rejected, right? And it's made flat. And what it does, it improves the signal to noise ratio, but it also increases the legibility of the signal. That's the principal reason why we use it, right? Okay. Go ahead. So, if I look at the pre-emphasize pre and de-emphasize, mm -hmm. if I look with the frequency response, if I multiply both box, it should be the ideal compact filter. If you, if you take the, 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 the this <laughs> guy yes. and this guy, no. this one, yes. it well, if you take this one and this one, they cancel each other. It's uh, ideal low pass filter. Yeah, ideal low pass filter. Yeah. Ideal low pass filter, with exception of some gain, right? You can always get gain up and down, but spectrally it is flat. It is flat. That's a, that's a good way of doing it. All right? So now that we, we've seen this uh, idea, let's work out some math. The objective here is to see how much of an additional improvement in signal-to-noise ratio we get by using pre-emphasis and the emphasis okay. And what I'm going to do is, uh, let me give you some example of the circuit, also so that you, uh, so this is not abstract. You know, when it comes to analog communication that you have seen so far, we have all of these fancy names, envelope detector, you know, discriminator, limiter, pre-emphasis, de-emphasis, right? And when I draw them, it's kind of disappointing. It's a couple of resistors and a capacitor or something like this. But, you know, this is just one simple implementation. What is more important for you to remember, why are they there, right? When I say limiter, you should remember that this is a circuit that gets rid of amplitude variations in FM. When I say discriminator, it actually translates the frequency, very, uh, instantaneous frequency into amplitude variations that you can pass to the envelope detector that will going to produce the signal that is the envelope of the modulated K. So uh, in actual circuitry, you know, these guys can have different implementations, but what is important is to remember the function. Uh, I have a friend who, who actually designed, you know how he can buy, he works for Philips. And he, I don't know what he does today, but a couple, when I talked to him last, he was actually doing FM radio. And you know, for example, if you get MP3 players and cell phones, they all have FM radio, right? And what, the way how they're doing it in Philips, you take the signal, you sample it, and you do all of these things that I talked about digitally. Right, all numbers, right? You just multiply, de-emphasize, emphasize. You take FFT and then you, you know, multiply, implement all the filters digitally, right? So in, in their case, none of these circuits that I'm going to be drawing are valid, but the idea is there. This is what I need to do. I need to emphasize, de-emphasize, detect the envelope, or whatever may be the case. Actually, let me leave this for a little while. Maybe we'll need it. So, example <coughs> of a pre-emphasis. So, let's uh, take a look at circuit that might look somewhat like this. <coughs> Right, this is 
is your m of t. And this is your m pre-emphasized. This is resistor R, and this is capital R C. I have that R is much greater than the R. So how cool is this? Very, very simple circuit, right? So let's uh, determine the frequency response of the circuit. So age of omega is going to be R over R plus R in parallel with 1 over J omega C, right? I have a voltage divider where the voltage at this point is this over some of these two impedes. <coughs> so this is Okay, there's an uh, error here, but this is R, R plus R times 1 over J omega C over R plus 1 over J omega C. If I multiply top and bottom here by uh, J omega C, I get R over R plus capital R 1 plus J omega C R. And if I multiply everything by this 1 plus j omega cr, I end up with r, 1 plus j omega cr, divided by uh, r plus r plus uh, let me see, I, have, I think I have error here, j omega c. So J omega C R times a little R. So I can neglect now this uh, uh, everything downstairs. You know, if this R is big enough, then and this R is small enough, then uh, R can be neglected relative to the R. And then this term is also much smaller than R. So I can make this approximately be R over capital R, 1 plus J omega C. When this is true. And uh, this uh, can be written as R over capital R, 1 plus J omega over omega 0, or R where this omega zero is one over C. Right, so this is your um, what we call the scope mean frequency. That's where you, your uh, the mean of, of your of your curve starts to occur. If you write this just as a function h of f, then this is some constant r over r. 1 plus j f over 0. We're here now at 0 is 1 over 2 pi c. So that's, that's the knee of the characteristics. So you can see this is a simple passive circuit. Where is the, let's uh, draw um, Let's draw a plot of, uh, of the frequency response for this circuit. We call those plots, you probably remember them, body plots. Right? So uh, let's uh, take a look at pen log of magnitude of H of F. I think, uh, do I take a square? Yeah. So, this becomes uh, 10 log of r over r squared times 1 plus f over f0 squared. Right? And uh, this can be seen as 20 log r over capital r plus 10 log 1 plus f over f0 
zero and the quantity is square. That's the frequency response of this filter expressed in dV, right? So uh, I take ten log of the frequent of the magnitude squared, and if I take the magnitude of this, uh, this is r over r square root of one plus this squared. But when I take the magnitude squared, I have r over r squared, and then the square root here disappears. Right? And then this is now 10 log of a times b, which is 10 log of a, plus 10 log of b. And when you take the 10 log of r over r squared, this 2 comes down and becomes 20 log. So you have 20 log of this plus 10 log of, uh, of uh, f over m zero. These are, these are body plots. Remember them from like circuit theory or like So let me now plot this. See what, what is happening. This is your frequency axis, F. This is my F0. Um, maybe I should let me move this F0 a little bit more. So, <coughs> or, or better yet. This is 0 0.1, F0, this is F0, this is 10, zero. okay? So when F is smaller than F0, and in practice that means when F is smaller than F0 over 10, then this F over F0 is 1 over 10 squared, it's 1 over 100, that's much smaller than 1, log of 1, is zero, right? So, so for f much smaller than f zero, this term goes away, right? And the only thing that I have is this one, 20 log r over r. r is much smaller than r, so we're actually uh, starting with some uh, with some relatively small value d b. And then at this f zero, this term starts kicking in. And it gives me increase in uh, the frequency response of 20 dBs per decade, right? Well, how do I see that? Well, if this f is much larger than f0, then I can neglect this one. And then 2 comes outside, becomes 20 log f of f0. So every decade increase in frequency, I'm getting 20 dB improvement in my, in my uh, frequency response. So this is the characteristics of this circuit, right? Where is it that I'm making the larger error, largest error, do you remember? I mean, this is obviously some sort of approximation. How does the actual curve look like? It looks like this, right? It's pretty close here, and then it kind of goes like this. And then it's pretty close here as well. How large is this difference here? How large is this difference? Two. Two? Any other suggestions? Three. <laughs> so it's three dB. So here I'm, I'm three dB f. But generally, this is the shape of the characteristics. Now, why does it? Why does this do what we want free emphasis to do? It is kind of slightly different than what I said here. I said, well, let us amplify the higher portion of the spectrum. What this does is actually uh, attenuates the lower portion, right? But still, you know, uh, what, it, what it does, it, it uh, uh, frequent, uh, uh, spectrally shapes your signal so that it, uh, it uh, changes the relationship between, uh, between the lower frequency components and high frequency components. What I'm gonna do here, obviously, I'm losing power because I'm attenuating the lower portion I'm going to follow this up with an amplifier to bring everything up, right? But what is important here is since this is a passive circuit, you cannot amplify anything, it's actually frequency shaping your signal. It is, it is uh, letting the high frequency go through while attenuating the lower portion of the spectrum. So emphasizing the higher portion of the spectrum of your signal. So that's your uh, pre-emphasis, and I said, as I said, since, since you're actually attenuating the whole signal, 
what uh, you will do here is you will put a pre-emphasis circuit and then you will follow this with an amplifier that would have a gain that, uh, so this is your frequency shaping. And this is amplification. And uh, these two combined would give you the, the processing that we need to provide by pre-emphasis. We would emphasize the higher portion of the signal <coughs> spectrum. So let's take a look at now the emphasis. How would I implement the emphasis? <coughs> So simple the E circuit. This one would look like this. Okay. This is your input and this is your output. So this is V in, V out, this is C R. Here H, the emphasis of omega is going to be 1 over J omega C over R plus uh, 1 over J omega C, which is uh, going to be uh, 1 over 1 plus J omega C R, or I can write that as 1 over J omega, omega 0. Uh, where omega zero is going to be one over RC, or if I want to just write everything in terms of frequency, H of F is one over one plus J F over F zero, where this F zero is one over two pi RC. So you can see this filter here is, uh, what kind of filter are we talking about? It's a low pass filter, first order low pass filter. You can see that it attenuates higher frequency uh, uh, components of your signal spectrum. And, uh, and uh, it kind of compensates for the amplification that you obtain uh, from the, from the preamps. If I were to look at here, 10 log of H, the emphasis of F magnitude squared becomes 10 log of 1 over 1 plus f over f0 squared and this is equal to minus 10 log of 1 plus f over f0 squared. I use the property of the log that log of x is uh, one minus log of 1 over x. And uh, for f much smaller than f0, h the emphasis of f, uh, or I should say 10 log of that, 10 log of h the emphasis of f magnitude squared is approximately 10 log of 1, which is 0. Why? When f is much smaller than f0, this term here is much smaller than 1. So the, it is 0 dB. And then for f much larger than f0, 10 log of magnitude of the emphasis of f squared is approximately 10 log f over f0 squared which is 20 log f over f0. So if I were to plot this in a body plot, so this is your 10 log h, the emphasis of f magnitude squared. This is my f0. Up to F zero, I can say it's approximately this. 
and after f0, it goes at minus 20 dB per decade. Just like in the, this case here, I'm making some error by using the straight line approximation, and this error is here, where this goes smooth as opposed to having this mean. The error here is g dB. So I'm never, you know, by using this approximation, I'm never more than 3 dB away from the actual uh, value of the, of the uh, curve. So you combine these two, and you can see that if you place this at zero at the same point, you can see what happens. You're flat up to this point, but when you combine it, this one pulls up, this one pulls down, so you stay flat all across the board. So that's the uh, combination of the pre-emphasis and the emphasis. Now that uh, we have examples and some idea how it works, let's uh, see what kind of performance do we get, performance improvement do we get from use of the pre-emphasis and the emphasis. So let's, let me address that. As we have already discussed, for signal, the pre-emphasis, the emphasis combination cancel each other. So as far as signal is concerned, nothing happens, right? The only improvement you get here, the source of the improvement in the signal to noise ratio, is because the noise is being suppressed, right? So what we need to calculate is the power of the noise before use of the de-emphasis, and then the power of the noise after the use of the de-emphasis, and the difference of these powers is going to be the improvement of, of that comes by the spectral shape. So before <coughs> the emphasis, we have that the power spectral density of the noise is uh, going to be one half k squared f squared over the power of the signal times the <coughs> And zero. So if I were to calculate now uh, the power of the noise in this case, it's an integral from minus w to w, Sn of f dm. Well, in our case, this is two times integral from zero to w, uh, one half k squared f squared over s times n zero df. And when you integrate this, let's see, this 2 and 2 cancels, k squared s over n0 come, comes in the output, and it's going to be w cubed over 3. So when you calculate this integral, it becomes k squared n0 over s times w cubed over 3. So that's the power of the noise at the output when no de-emphasis is used. How did I determine it? Well, I know the power spectral density. I have to integrate under the power spectral density in a given bandwidth to obtain the power of the signal. Right? And in, it's just a simple integral that you develop. After, uh, when the emphasis is used, power spectral density at the output uh, and let me call it Sn de emphasized of n is going to be Sn of f times the h of de emphasis of f magnitude squared. Remember this relationship? 
we say that the power spectral density of the noise is now going to be whatever is the power spectral density of the noise without the emphasis times the magnitude square of the of the uh, frequency response of the filter. Remember, this is how we calculate the, the okay, for any random process. We have that the power spectral density is the output is whatever is the power spectral density the input times the magnitude square of the filter. So in our case, this becomes this one half k squared f squared over s times n zero. So that takes care of the first part, and the de-emphasis is one plus f over f zero squared. Right. So that's the magnitude square of the de-emphasis. And to obtain the power now, I need to integrate within a bandwidth of my signal. So the power of the de-emphasized noise is going to be integral from minus w, 2 plus w, as noise de-emphasized of f dm. Right? That's a, just a general way how I would determine the power. In this particular case, noise de-emphasized of f, I'm going to say this is 2 times, and I'm going to integrate from 0 to w. And then I'm going to put this thing uh, upstairs. So this becomes uh, 1 half times k squared times f squared over s times n0 times 1 over 1 plus f over f0 squared d f. So that's uh, what needs to be integrated. Let me just uh, take one more step at least. 2 uh, times 1 half is uh, 1. So I'm going to take, I can take out k squared n0 over s. n0 over s. Integral from 0 to w. Then what I'll do is I'm going to say f squared over f0 squared df over f0 1 plus f over f0 squared. Do you see what I did? I divided everything here by f0 squared to get uh, uh, get everything kind of in function as, as a variable f of f0. Now I have to multiply by something to make everything balance. So what do I need to multiply by? Do you see? I have divided this one by f0 squared, divided this one by f0, so I have f0 cubed, right? So I need to multiply everything by f0 cubed. See that? f0 cubed. Now, this, uh, this integral <coughs> splits into two very easy integrals, so 0 f0 cubed over s. Let me add 1 here. If I add 1, then top and bottom cancels. So this becomes an integral from 0 to w. Um, actually, let me introduce also substitution. x is equal to f of f0. So this becomes dx. When f is equal to uh, w, what do I have here? What is, the, what is x? No, when x is equal to f over uh, uh, f0. So when f is equal to w, x is equal to w over f0. So it's w over f0. And then I have here minus. Um, I have added 1, then I need to subtract 1, right? So if I subtract 1, so it's minus 2, 0, dx over 1 plus x squared. That's, uh, that's what's happening there. And then now these two are very easy. This is k squared. And 0 times x squared cubed over s. This one is just uh, w over m 0 minus our tangent. Okay. 
So that's the that's the uh, now I have here squared and here I have cubed. So is it possible that I messed up something somewhere? Huh? All nodes cubed, okay. So in the new nodes it's it's wrong. There's there's multiple mistakes in the new nodes. You know, because uh, what what happens is sometimes I just copy the old notes, and when I'm copying, I'm making a whole bunch of mistakes because I'm not doing stuff. I'm just copying. Right? So now it's uh, okay. So that's this is the correct result. So if you look at now, how big is the improvement? Let me call it Q. Q is going to be the ratio, right, of all the noise before divided by the noise after, right? So it's going to be the name N over N de-emphasized. And let's see here. It's going to be K squared N0 W cubed over S times 3 divided by K squared N0 F0 cubed over S times W over F0 minus our tangent W over F0. So that's improvement. You can see it, it cancels. A lot of things cancel. So when everything is said and done, you end up with one third W cubed F0 cubed and then W over F0 minus R tangent. So that's an additional improvement beyond processing gain, right? You have a processing gain, and then you have improvement due to de emphasis and pre emphasis, right? So there's a quite a bit of improvement. So let's uh, look at an example here of the uh, emphasis used in the broadcasting. Uh, in broadcasting, we have W is equal, so this is uh, PB in FM broadcasting. From FM broadcasting, W is 15 kilohertz. Everything we listen on the radio fits within a 15 kilohertz. Right? So uh, why 15 kilohertz? Because that's what most people hear, right? After 15 kilohertz, uh, even though uh, theoretically we can hear, you know, it, it's so weak. Most of the, all the music and speech and everything after 15 kilohertz has insignificant contribution. F0 in uh, broadcasting uh, is 2.1 kilohertz. That's our pre-emphasis uh, frequency. So if you were to plug this in, you end up with Q being uh, 15 kilohertz divided by 2.1 kilohertz to the power of 3 divided by 3 times 15 over 2.1 minus our tangent of 15 over 2.1. And that when calculated is 21 27. So you get, just by using this simple, simple idea, you get 20 times improvement in your signal to noise ratio. Right? So it's really, really significant. And when you translate this into dB, you're getting 13, 27 dB of additional improvement on the top of your processing gain. So this is really, really significant. And I said it's significant from the signal to noise ratio, but also significant from the standpoint of improving the legibility of your signal. But all of this holds if your signal to noise ratio at the input is above the threshold. If you're below the threshold, none of this holds. Not, nothing helps you. If you're below the threshold, your signal decay is really not fast. Right? So your input signal to noise ratio needs to be uh, larger than 13 plus 10 log of 1 plus beta. Have a question? All right. So let me assign homework. 
This is, uh, according to my records, number 14. There are exercises 814, 815, and 816, and an assignment. None. There is no assignment. Just go through exercises. Any questions? Okay, let's take a little bit of a break and then we'll do some problems.